all the folks who lived at where I lived were all fond of flowers. All of them. All of them. Flowers and birds, they, it was part of their life in a way. Well, my father used to sort of, when he would go and look to see if the hay was ready, the grass was ready for cutting, he'd say, oh, well, um, I, I can see so-and-so and such a flower. They're all growing big. They're, it's getting ready to be cut. Um, so, you know, that's how it was. There was no management at all, really. It was very traditional in them days. You know, we had, uh, had no fertiliser or anything like that. And there was no big bale silages in them days, or silage clamps or anything. Everything was done by horses and manpower. Like. Their meadows were full of little herbs and burnets and uh, all kinds of different little herbs and spices of the upland meadows. But they didn't yield very well. And most of these farms ran out of fodder before the spring came, if it was a late spring. And this was what the war did. It altered things. It made people plough up uh, some of these old meadows and uh, sow different grasses when the time came, after they'd cropped them. And they saw that they could produce more by putting new seeds into these old meadows. And this is what changed the, that was the start of the change in upland farming to me. It's the more with the horses. And then the horses had to do all the other things. They used to turn with the turner and rake with the raker. And then used to, Carted with them, and I've seen our horses being so tired, they were not enough in the cart, so they were so tired. I think it was about 1947, we got a Fergie tractor with all the implements, and then we just kept the horses till they died. Yeah, Fergie tractor, it was a, the best thing that ever was, was Fergie tractors. Everything, you see, depended on the only power you had was manpower and horsepower. So you literally couldn't do the sort of things that people do with tractors. And the other thing that was a big change, consequent upon the tractors, was the making of silage. Well, you could make silage without tractors, but it, it was not an easy thing to do. Nobody around here did it. And the other thing, you see, that they'd done with these tractors, they were able to put on far more fertiliser. And fairly soon, they got a lot more grass, but far fewer herbs, you see. What the motorway has done has allowed enormous numbers of people to come to the lakes very quickly. and. Um, I mean, I I can remember walking the, the High Fell in the 60s and 70s all day with my dog and never meeting a soul. And I suggest you can't do that today. I can understand why, but it brings its own pressure. And the pressures are our people. In my day, people were limited by the free time they had. So the number of people who could actually get to the lakes who didn't live here was quite limited. It was still the playground of rich people in my day. Unguided climbing and climbing for everybody came in really in the 50s and the 60s. And that's a wonderful freedom.
the corncrakes that they used to nest in the meadows. See what he was doing, you could hear the corncrakes cracking away in this field opposite. Hack, hack, hack. Oh, you often used to hear corncrakes, and then they gradually got less and less. And after the war came and the sadists came and intensive farming started, they just disappeared, obviously. The nests couldn't survive the earlier morning. It was exhilarating to see the recovery of the peregrine population from a, the terrible fear that the population was going to become extinct to find out that with the highest density of peregrines for anywhere in the world, never mind the UK, in Cumbria, was something that I was very, very proud of. The hay fields were totally different because the hay fields were like bunches of mixed flowers. The hay was full of flowers. And in the winter when you put it in the byres for the cows to eat, you'd see all these dried flowers. It was lovely. And the hay when it was made was beautiful. It was pale green. A pale linen green colour. That was good hay. And you used to dig a hole into the middle of the hay root and the haystack and pull it out and sniff it. And see if it smelled right. And when it smells right, it smells almost like tea. We would go nutting in late August, in September, shake the trees, and the nuts would come down like snowflakes. Beautiful brown hazelnuts. Lovely could get pockets full in quite a short time. They were so rich on these trees when they were ripe you shook the tree and the nut would come out of its husk and uh, they were on the ground in front of you. Well that was just open land, uh, what they called the intake and that was where the cattle and the sheep used to graze. You used to just sit in the house and watch them grazing up there. Then it was all planted with trees. Well, it changed after the war when the forestry took over. The um, Italian prisoners of wars, they came and drained the land. The next thing was the uh, forestry came along and planted it all. This gamekeeper was giving us these big uh, uh, greater back by gull eggs and because you had to blow them and we would blow the contents into a cup and uh, we would have it as an omelette. Uh, there was a lot of uh, eggs being collected and uh, and you know used, used for to eke out the, the rations during the war. In the war itself, we did a lot of being outside collecting things. And we collected lots and lots and lots of nettles. And they were dried, hung in the barn and dried, and then stuffed into bags. And they went away. Um, and then rose hips, of course, all the children around here gathered hips. I mean, we used to go out and pick stones of rose hips during the war to be made into rose hips. But you'd have to go a long way now to find the right sort of hedges and earth nuts. Uh, the little sort of uh, white flower that grows in pastures um, in the spring. And if you dig down, you find that there's a lovely nut at the bottom, a bit like chestnut. And my father used to take us out when we were children. He used to find earth nuts for us. And then we'd just eat them there and then. You know, we didn't bring them in and wash them or anything. But we're still alive to tell the tale. Nothing changes the fowls apart from the use of them. They're there, they don't change. It's what people do to them that changes them.